When people die, it's up to the rest of us who are still here to tell their life stories. That's how they live on. And that's why we call this podcast Immortalized. Welcome to Immortalized. I am Stephen Siegel from Legacy.com, the world's largest network of obituaries. And I'm Linnea Crowther, Legacy's news editor and lead obituary writer. Linnea, this is our 12th episode, marking the end of season one of Immortalized. So we've talked about how people use obituaries to remember people they care about. We've looked at whose obituaries have been getting the most attention recently. We've talked with grief experts about how stories help us process the death of our loved ones. And we've talked with obituary reporters about how they write those stories. Right, but one big thing we haven't talked about yet is the pandemic and how that has affected the way families have been honoring and remembering their loved ones. So let's look at that today. A lot of families during the height of pandemic restrictions in 2020 weren't able to have funerals for their loved ones who happened to die then, were they? No, and this applies to people who died of COVID as well as people who died of all the other things people die of. There were a lot of restrictions on gatherings, especially in spring of 2020. There were areas where you couldn't legally have more than 10 people gathered in one place. But then even after those passed or in areas where those restrictions were not as severe, there were plenty of people who had just a personal discomfort with getting together and or traveling and people who, who just couldn't do it based on you know, their own personal medical history. So many of the lives that were lost in 2020 and even into early 2021, they were only honored with maybe a tiny funeral or an online funeral. And for plenty of those people who died in in those times, there was just no funeral at all. You know, I had one friend who lost his dad at the very beginning of the shutdowns in 2020, and they had the very small funeral. I think they had 10 of the closest family members there, and that's all they did. They didn't even have a video funeral. I had another friend who lost her husband last spring, also pretty early in the pandemic, and she didn't want to do the tiny funeral. They had nothing at that time. She and their daughter attended his his burial, and that was it. You know, my grandmother died just this year, and the funeral home let us know proactively that if we wanted to live stream a funeral service, they would be happy to set that up for us so that family members who might not be able to attend in person would be able to still watch at least and do that on Facebook Live, which they'd be familiar with already. And that's the sort of thing that certainly while that technology was there before, it really became widespread as a funeral alternative in 2020 because of all the social distancing and quarantining and whatnot. Yeah, I think there were probably just only a tiny percentage of funeral homes that were offering live streamed funerals prior to 2020. And and now I think it, it would be unusual to find one that just can't or won't do it. And live streamed funerals are great. It's such an incredible use of technology, but it's just not the same, right, as attending a funeral in person. It is better than nothing. And there's no question about that. But it's there's something that isn't the same in the energy of being together. Um, it, it's it, there, there's there's just something that happens when you can hug people and and not just hear what they're saying, but be able to hold their hand while they're saying it. And, and these are little things that maybe seem obvious, but I, I feel like it's hard to understate how much they add up. Yeah, I think that for some people who were maybe only able to attend a live streamed funeral, you know, sitting alone in their home, it may have just even helped to underscore how isolated they felt. Here's an an event that they really would have wanted to be at in person. And here they are watching yet another thing on their computer screen, you know. We talked to some of Legacy's readers about their experiences with funerals during the pandemic. And I heard a variety of ways that, that people were having funerals. You know, I talked to one person whose 
loved one's funeral only had five people there in person plus the officiant, and then they live streamed it online. I talked to another person who said that her family was in Massachusetts, but she lives in Arizona. And it was at a time when she couldn't fly back to Arizona and and hasn't yet been comfortable to get back. And they did what she called some sort of drive-through ceremony. I'm sure that there were a lot of people doing something like that at the time, a drive-through visitation, right. you know. Uh, so she, she, she just didn't even experience that funeral at all because she couldn't be there. You know, it's certainly totally understandable why we had to refrain from congregating in person, um, even for something as important as a funeral. It was the safe thing to do. But still, there was a real emotional and spiritual price to pay for that safety, it seems like. There really was. And, you know, I don't know if everybody really understands the importance of funerals. You know, you'll hear someone say, oh, when I die, I don't want you to have a funeral. You know, just just bury me or, or whatever. And and I think that these people don't understand that it's not really about them. It's about the people who are left to, to grieve them. And there's a real piece of healing from grief. Is, is attending the funeral. There's much more to having a funeral than just burying that recently deceased person. You know, one of the most important things that funerals do is they help us understand that the death actually happened. We are there for this ritual. Sometimes we see the body of the deceased at the funeral. Not always. We don't all have an open casket funeral. But even if that's not part of it, just being there at the funeral really helps hammer at home that this death really happened and helps you get out of, you know, that denial phase of grief. It's also, as you were saying before, it's such a big part of comfort and support, getting together with people in person. You know, you mentioned hugging. Hugging is clinically proven to reduce stress. And when we have a chance to do that, you know, kind of en masse with so many different people coming up to, to shake your hand or hug you, it helps. Being at the funeral encourages us to mourn. It encourages us to cry and express that grief in a place where it's okay to do it. You can feel comfortable crying at a funeral in a way that you probably wouldn't feel comfortable, you know, when that grief hits you at a time when you're at work or at the grocery store or what have you, you know? Right. So when we can't have that funeral, how much does it matter to the way we process what has happened? Is it just unfortunate that we have to skip that part? Or, you know, do we find people experiencing real consequences of having to do without yeah, it can have real consequences. And actually, d during the pandemic, grief experts have been able to kind of prove that even more with some recent research that they've done. I talked to uh, a while back a psychology professor, Dr. Robert A. Niemeyer, who, with one of his colleagues, Sherman Lee, had done a study on people who lost a loved one during those pandemic restrictions in 2020. And they talked to over 300, or sorry, over 800 people. And what they found was there, there's something called dysfunctional grief. It's a, it's a severe form of grief. It makes it hard to carry on, basically, with your normal life. Maybe you, after someone's loss, are wishing that you could just die so that you could be with them. You might feel just stuck and unable to get back on track at work, unable to take care of your family. You just don't want to. So they call this dysfunctional grief. And this is like grief on steroids. Yes. It's, it's bad grief that you are really stuck in, have trouble getting out of it. In normal times, this is something that about 5 to 10% of people grieving experience, this dysfunctional grief. In 2020, among the people that they surveyed for this study, two-thirds of them were experiencing dysfunctional grief. Wow. Yeah, it, it just skyrocketed in this time when we couldn't go through that important and comforting ritual of attending a large funeral to celebrate our person's life. So what does that look like in terms of what these people are actually experiencing? 
Well, you know, part of it, like I said, is this uh, is kind of inability to to just do your normal life. You know, this might look like severe depression, but but it also it's it's not necessarily exactly those things. There are a lot of different symptoms of dysfunctional grief, and they don't all have to be in effect for you to be experiencing dysfunctional grief. But you know, when we when we talked to these people who had lost someone during the pandemic, we heard some specific thoughts about how they were affected by that loss. And now I, I'm not saying that all of these people had dysfunctional grief, but they were all people who, you know, weren't able to have that full funeral. What people kept saying to me was that it still doesn't seem real. One person said it feels like it didn't actually even happen since she couldn't attend the funeral. People were saying that it was awful not to be able to hug their family members. Uh, in fact, awful was a word that I heard more than once. It was it was painful not being able to gather with people. So having been through that, having suffered a loss during this time and having been unable to have a funeral service when it happened, is that something that you can get past. Is there a way now that time has moved on and, you know, in different parts of the country, there are different levels of comfort with having, you know, in-person services that are larger, people are vaccinated now. Obviously, these are still complicated questions, but what are people able to do now if they find they're still having that kind of severe grief after the fact? You know, I'm sure you know that grief isn't something that you just fix, you know, it's something that you kind of live with for the rest of your life, but it changes and you kind of work through it. And and grief counseling, obviously, is one really important way that you do that. So I think that if someone is experiencing some of those symptoms of dysfunctional grief and they haven't already talked to a grief counselor, that that is an important part of it. But I think another thing that can really help at this point if they haven't already done it, is to have a memorial service. It's not the same as a funeral. You know, a, a memorial service is typically something that happens sometime after the death, you know, not necessarily that same week like a funeral often is, and typically does not have the deceased's remains present. But it's 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 just as useful as a funeral. It's not it's not a second best kind of thing. And in even this long, you know, even if someone died back in spring of 2020, you can still have a memorial service now, and it can help you with those issues of feeling, you know, that that the death isn't real, the 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 awfulness of not having been able to get that comfort and support from loved ones. That you can get that now. You know, my friend who I mentioned earlier, who who lost her husband last spring. She actually just had a memorial service for him in August on their wedding anniversary. She was able to have it outdoors because the weather was nice. Even though, you know, the pandemic isn't over when we do outdoor things, it can feel a little bit safer. Uh, And it was a, a really healing gathering. And I think she and a lot of their friends and family got a lot out of it. I've been hearing very similar things. Um, I have a friend whose mother died last year and they also ended up finally having the memorial service in August, this August, uh, after the family was all vaccinated. And she said the next day, I'd had so many anxieties and worries about the whole event, but they all melted away as soon as people started arriving. You know, even months afterwards, it meant so much to her to be able to have that service where everyone could share their love and their memories together. And I know they also did it outside where they felt more comfortable. Yeah, I know a lot of these have been happening over the past few months. I talked to a couple of funeral directors who were telling me that their schedules this past summer had been extra busy. I think especially in early summer when things were looking pretty good because they were working through this backlog of memorial services for people who couldn't or preferred not to have a funeral during the, the height of the pandemic. And, you know, if you have not done this, but you've thought about, oh, maybe we could still have a memorial service. You you can still do it. There's still this year, some warm weather probably left to come if you wanted to do an outdoor service. You could even delay it until next summer. There's not a time limit for this. You, you do this when it feels okay to do it. Maybe you would rather not do an outdoor service and you want to wait until we have COVID under better control. Hopefully that's coming sometime in the near future. 
you can do this when it feels right for you and your family. Now, on the flip side, I know not everybody feels like they want to go back and have a funeral for someone who died a while ago. Some of the people that we talked to at Legacy, you know, when we asked if they were thinking about having a, a delayed memorial service, said things like, it just feels weird to do something a year later, or I don't want to reschedule because things are still, you know, a question mark for us, or, or just we're all ready to move on. Yeah, I know that there are certainly people who feel like, well, it, it would just bring back all those often tough memories that we have of 2020 and early 2021 to do a memorial service now. And, you know, that's okay. It's not like, well, you have to, at some point, do this memorial service, but it might be the right thing for some families. But in other cases, you know, maybe there's somebody who really does wish that they could, you know, ask for a redo on the funeral, but it doesn't really feel like it's their place to be the one who plans that whole big memorial service. So, you know, I'm talking about maybe somebody who lost a friend or their aunt died or their father-in-law died. So they're not the immediate family who would typically do that planning, you know? But you don't have to necessarily do it that way, right? You, you don't mm -hmm. have to have a funeral style memorial service formally in order to do something to get together and celebrate someone's life. Right, you can approach this kind of grieving ritual in a in a much more casual way if if that's something that works for you. Yeah, and there are all kinds of ways to do this, big and small. There's there's gatherings, as you said, but there's even ways that you can incorporate some grieving ritual just as a single person in a way that will help you work through some of that grief. So, like for example. You can sit down and write a condolence card to someone, you know, an, an immediate family member of the person that was lost. A and it's okay to do that, even if it's been quite a while, even if that death happened last spring. I cannot think of very many people who are going to be upset to get a caring note from you even a year or more after they lost their loved one. And the process of, of writing that note, thinking of some favorite memories and writing them down maybe even going through your photo collection and finding a favorite photo of the person who died and, and you know tucking that in with the card. That's going to help both their family and help you heal and work through some of that grief while you're taking the time to, to remember them and write about them. Why don't we talk for a minute about some of those kinds of options, some of those kinds of possibilities that people you know might be able to use as ideas for smaller memorial services that they can, you know, they can put together with whatever group of people are inclined to do it. So one thing that a lot of families already do, and this is a, a great thing that you could do if you just had a small funeral service, when the headstone is ready, which, you know, typically take, takes some time after the death, you can hold a ceremony to dedicate the headstone. Now, this is already a common ritual in Judaism. Uh, and the, the family and friends will come together to read prayer and scripture, and they might say a few words about the deceased, but you don't have to follow that faith to have a headstone dedication ceremony. You can bring everyone together when it's time for that headstone to be placed. And just seeing that name and the dates carved in stone can be a really important step, especially if you're someone who is kind of struggling with that, did this really happen? because you right. couldn't attend a funeral. Another possibility, you know, the headstone isn't um, always something that is happening on a timeline that makes sense for people to, you know, use as their excuse to get together. So another alternative is if you decide, okay, we're going to get together and have a celebration of our loved one's birthday even mm -hmm. though they are gone, their birthday is a date that is still going to happen every year. And it's one great opportunity to say, you know, we, we didn't get to have a funeral at the time. We're going to take this first next birthday and make that our celebration. We'll get together. We'll tell stories. We'll look at photos. We'll share memories. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a, a 75th birthday or 80th birthday, it doesn't have to be a special number, you know, just mm -hmm. whatever that next birthday is. 
is an occasion that feels appropriate to a ritual. You know, uh, also, people do sometimes get together on the anniversary of the death. And that's obviously another totally viable option. But I think that the, that birthday celebration feels a little bit less somber, maybe. Right. Yeah, it, it might be a, a nice time to to have, you know, kind of a kind of a happy, sad gathering, right? Yeah, because it's it's an occasion in which you're you're making the point of honoring their life. You're marking the death, but it's about their life. Mm-hmm. And and you know, none of these have to be elaborate, like planning a big memorial service. You can do something as simple as having a family dinner. It could be you know, that you all go out to dinner if nobody wants to cook, or you could have dinner at, at someone's house if you prefer not to go out. And one thing that people sometimes do when they're having a dinner like that and, and you know, there's somebody missing is that they'll leave one empty chair at the table and that symbolizes the person who's gone. And since this loss was pretty recent, you know, even if it's not all that you focus on, you're having a family dinner, you're probably catching up, you know, on what's going on in everybody's life, but you are bound to start talking about that person that you lost at some point. And that's when, once again, you can share memories and favorite stories. Spinning that one alternative farther, not every memorial gathering has to be something where you're you're absolutely, you know, required to pull together every single member of the family and friends. Mm-hmm. You know, my father's family, um, on a on a more or less annual basis, uh, my father and his his cousins, you know, all of all of his generation will get together and, you know, do a, a sort of mini reunion of just those of them that are that are close in a particular way. And that's okay, you know, if not everyone in your family is on the same page. Um, as far as meeting for a mini memorial, that's okay. It doesn't have to be everyone. Um, yeah. The people who the people who need the support, the people who want the support, pull them together. And and then taking that even one step further, you know, it, as I said at the beginning, it doesn't even have to be a gathering. Maybe. It just doesn't feel like you're the person who whose job it is to gather everybody, or maybe you don't feel comfortable getting together yet. You know, maybe you're someone who has enough um, underlying immune issues that that gathering just still isn't an option for you. So you can do things by yourself or virtually that can help you heal. Uh, one of them is creating an online memorial for the person that you lost, and that can mean building a website in their honor you know, with photos and stories, or it could even be something smaller and simpler, turning their social media profile into a memorial. And you can, you know, send that out to family and friends, invite them to contribute so that everybody's favorite memories and photos live in that online memorial. And this is one of the things that we see happening on a regular basis in the guest books that go with people's obituaries on Mm legacy.com. The most active legacy guest books on a regular basis are the ones where some members of the family keep coming back to those pages, you know, every year or every month or sometimes even every week. And they keep posting more photos, um, making it more of a, you know, a shrine, an online Mm -hmm. shrine, if you will. Um, They keep sharing more memories. They talk directly to the person who's gone. And it, it really does become a, a sort of a sort of digital sacred space. Yeah, that's uh, obviously a great place to do it. I've even seen families who write into their loved one's guest book every single day, and, and that helps them. It's a good thing to do if it helps you. Just to, to take a moment and underline something we just said, looking at photos, like it's such a simple act, but it's so powerful. And it's something that that has that power, whether you're doing it by yourself or with one or more of your family members, you know, there's something that's both so intimate and also so ritualized about going through a number of photos one at a time and, Mm -hmm. you know, visualizing the memories that each one of them conjures up. It does something for the soul, just bringing those, bringing those memories in front of you visually. It's an opportunity to, to not just relive those memories, but 
if you're so inclined to to cultivate the good thoughts of thanking this person for the good that they brought to your life. You know, another way that you can kind of offer that thank you to somebody that you lost, somebody that you've lost is making a memorial donation in their honor, uh, especially if if you know what their favorite charity was or what a cause that they cared about was and you know, you can choose the charity that aligns with that cause. But even if you don't know what their favorite charity or cause was, you can always contribute to your own and indicate that it's in this person's memory. Um, that's such a great way of carrying on the things that mattered in their life, even after they're not here to keep doing it. Or another thing that you can do if you're not sure what charity to contribute to is that you can help the whole earth, really, by having memorial trees planted in their name. Uh, you can go to legacy.com slash trees to learn more about ways to do that. On that note, that is our show for today. An important point. This episode of Immortalized marks the end of season one for our podcast. For our devoted listeners, don't worry, we will be back soon. We will be producing some special episodes over the fall and winter, and then our full second season will be up in 2022. Thank you to my co-host, Linnea Crowther, and our fabulous producer, John Maxwell. Thank you also to Legacy.com, where, as we just mentioned, You can now honor a loved one's memory any day of the year by planting memorial trees in their name. Just visit Legacy.com slash trees. To hear more about how we honor the life stories of those we care about, you can subscribe to Immortalized on your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just look up Legacy.com on YouTube. And if you're on Facebook, you can follow Legacy.com there for daily updates. Thanks for listening.